Welcome back, my friends. Currently, we're on day 251 of Russia's disastrous invasion of Ukraine. And yesterday, Russia launched revenge strikes to further target Ukraine's power grid. And Vladimir Putin himself said that the strikes on Ukraine's power infrastructure were in retaliation for Saturday's Ukrainian attack on the Black Sea fleet in Sevastopol. So here is what the capital city of Kyiv looks like without power. And this honestly just goes to show everyone that the Russian military doesn't know how to defeat the Ukrainian military. If they could use their long-range, high-precision uh, ballistic missiles to target and defeat the Ukrainian military, they would do that. And the fact that they're choosing to target civilian infrastructure, target the capital city of Kyiv, far behind the front lines, this just goes to show you that the Russian military doesn't know how to win, and they're just resorting to acts of terrorism at this point. And as a result of Russia's airstrikes, 80% of the city of Kyiv doesn't currently have a water supply. And on Russian state TV, they've stated that this is their objective. They want to deny proper water treatment and clean drinking water for the civilian population. Their master strategy this winter is to get as many Ukrainians sick from not having clean water to drink and clean water to cook with. They're deliberately targeting the elderly, children, uh, the most vulnerable in Ukraine's society. So this is the response uh, from the Ukrainians. This is the general attitude of the people in Kyiv right now towards Russia. It's not really, uh, not really convincing them to surrender. Here is a clip from President Zelensky's nightly address. Yes, this, the streets in Kyiv are dark, and the streets of many other Ukrainian cities are also without power. But this is what he says. Together, we will walk through this darkness. The most important thing is to preserve the light in our hearts. Let's watch about 30 seconds of him speaking. Звернення моє буде трішки пізнішим, бо робочий день ще не закінчився. Просто хотів на кілька секунд підтримати вас. Непростий день б'ють варвари по нашій енергетиці, але я впевнений, ми пройдемо цю темряву мужньою, негідно. Головне зберегти світло в своєму серці і в кожному. Russia cannot extinguish the light in the hearts of all Ukrainians. And for those concerned about Ukraine's electrical grid, I actually think this won't be complicated for European partners to help Ukraine fix. Twelve countries have already stepped up to offer supplies to Ukraine to help restore their energy infrastructure. The most important thing for Ukraine right now is to stop these air attacks, and they can do this by increasing their air defense capabilities. And just from when Russia launched all those attacks two weeks ago, we can already see the dramatic improvements in Ukraine's air defense systems. In response to the attack on the Black Sea Fleet, Russia launched about 50 of these cruise missiles, but Ukraine is saying that they successfully intercepted 44 of them. So what does that mean? That means that from Russia's very limited remaining high-precision, long-range weapons that cost millions of dollars each, uh, they now have a failure rate of between 80 and 90 percent. Whatever they input as the target, whatever they want to hit, they're experiencing an 80 to 90 percent failure rate uh, in that the missile will probably be shot down. And uh, congratulations to the German IRIS-T air defense system the territory that it was covering, uh, the Ukrainians are saying that it had a 100% success rate. It shot down successfully every Russian cruise missile that went within its area. And this was just delivered two weeks ago, so this is already having a huge impact on the war. In addition to the airstrikes, Russia is also saying that they're pulling out of the Ukrainian grain export deal that was negotiated with Turkey and the UN. And they're saying that they're not going to allow Ukraine to use the safe corridor to get their food exports out. But we're seeing an interesting standoff uh, currently occurring 
between Turkey and Russia, as President Erdogan is furious if Russia reneges on their part of the deal. So Erdogan, as of now, is saying the deal is still in fact. Russia cannot back out of it. It is Turkish warships that are escorting Ukrainian grain ships through the Black Sea, through NATO-controlled waters to get out to the Mediterranean, and Russia can't really do anything about it. Yes, Russia has a very large navy, but they have ships in the Baltic Sea, the Arctic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Mediterranean. In the Black Sea, this is more or less becoming a NATO-controlled lake, and Turkey is deciding to flex its power on Russia as they're losing ships uh, left and right. So President Erdogan ordered Turkish ships to continue escorting Ukrainian ships through the safe passage uh, es uh, territory that was agreed upon by Russia. The ball is now in Russia's court whether they want to fire on Turkish ships to stop them, which could trigger a war with NATO. So Russia, as of the time I'm filming this video, is choosing not to fire on these ships. Here's an interesting report from the Kyiv Post. Uh, Ukraine's intelligence chief gave an interview, and he says that Putin will not survive this war against Ukraine. So the head of Ukraine's intelligence, General Kirilo Budunov, has said that President Putin is unlikely to survive this war, and that currently there are active discussions happening in Russia about who would be there to replace him. So I'm sure there are members of the Russian military, FSB, the Kremlin, they're meeting in basements without cell phones or any recording devices, and they are having these conversations of politically, what is Russia going to do in a post-Putin world, and it might come sooner than you think. And I've also been making this argument on my channel that Putin will not survive this war, especially since he decided to politically annex these Ukrainian territories, there's no way for him to walk this back now. So for Putin, it is victory or death, and given the poor performance of the Russian military, victory is not looking as likely as death. So at some point, someone is coming for Putin. This has to make him pretty paranoid. And in this interview, Ukraine's intelligence chief also stated that Putin is currently using three body doubles. So dictators around the world, from Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, Kim Jong-un, they all use body doubles because they're paranoid about being assassinated. And who's the real Putin? How can you spot the real one? Well, maybe the real Putin is the one with black, dead, decaying hands. He looks absolutely terrible. So this might be the real Putin. Uh, and who are the body doubles? I'm convinced that the real Putin has not left Moscow these last eight months, so anytime Putin makes a public appearance, maybe in Belarus or Iran, that's a body double. That's, that's, that's a paid actor. If you remember from a couple months ago when Putin went to Iran to meet with Erdogan, Erdogan kept him waiting in front of the cameras for about 50 seconds. I knew that the real Putin would never let this happen, so... This is clearly uh, the body double here, but uh, he's been standing here for over 30 seconds in this clip. Let's just watch the way that he greets and, and, and meets with President Erdogan of Turkey. This man looks like he's in pretty good spirits. Uh, I imagine Putin's body doubles live very comfortably, and all they have to do is shake hands and smile in front of the camera. They don't have any real responsibility or, or probably stress in their life, aside from Putin is now a target for pretty much everyone at this point. Let's now pivot and check in with Russia's efforts to mobilize their population. Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu did announce an end to their partial military mobilization, but there are indications that Russia is already planning for the next round of mobilization, and school children in Rostov were sent home with a note from their school to give to their mothers, and this is what it reads. 
Dear mothers, do you have any military training? How do you rate your physical fitness on a scale of 1 to 10? And do you consider yourself a patriot of Russia? So what this indicates to me is that in the next or future rounds of mobilization, uh, the government is probably going to start drafting and mobilizing women into specific roles to uh, support the Russian military in their efforts in Ukraine. It's coming. Additionally, school teachers in Tomsk have been asked to contribute part of their salary towards Putin's war. The average monthly salary for a teacher in this region is only 487 US dollars a month, and school administrators or city officials are asking them to chip in some of their salary to help the soldiers on the front line. But given how rampant corruption is in Russia, more than likely this money is just being stolen and kept for themselves, and it's not actually going to benefit any Russian soldiers on the front lines. But we can see that given the nature of this war and, and Putin's desperation, he is leaning heavily on the school system to find bodies to go to war or find money, but it's also about indoctrinating the children to get them ready to fight this war to rebuild the Soviet Empire for the next coming decades. So here is a clip. I'm only going to show you about 15 seconds. I think these are middle schoolers, and your guess is as good as mine. What the heck are they doing? <laughs> So the Russian school system to begin with probably wasn't that good, but given Putin kicking off this war in February, I'm sure the level of uh, Z patriotism and uh, pro-Russian, pro-Putin propaganda is through the roof, probably all day, every day. All The only thing these children do is uh, Z stuff. And there's no difference between what Russia is doing today and what Nazi Germany did in the 1930s, arranging school children into these Nazi swastikas and having children march around the schoolyard with these Nazi Zs on their back. It's just despicable. And because the uh, month of October is over, we got our latest uh, Levada opinion poll. Levada is the only polling agency in Russia that you can probably trust that they're doing, you know, statist proper statistical analysis to give representative surveys. You can't, you can't trust what people are saying because they don't have freedom of speech in Russia. But even given what the Russian people are responding to, these numbers are very interesting. So what was the opinion poll in September? And 48% of Russians were in favor of starting peace talks, and 44% were in favor of continuing offensive operations. Mobilization began in September, so here we are in October, and now 57% of Russians want to begin peace, peace talks with Ukraine, and only 36% want to continue military operations to maybe take Odessa or take Kharkiv or take the whole country. Also from this Levada survey, uh, they break it down by age demographic, and this is pretty interesting. Uh, what this says is that 66% of respondents over the age of 55 are in favor of mobilization, in favor of this war continuing. So it's older people in Russia who seem willing to let their children and grandchildren go to Ukraine to die. Meanwhile, when you look at those surveyed between the ages of 18 and 24, surprise, surprise, 58% of them oppose mobilization, and they want this war to uh, come to an end. So when you conscript and you draft and you mobilize young men who don't want to go to war and fight, this is what can happen. Here is a video that went viral on social media of a Russian soldier sabotaging, sabotaging his own BTR. So he's about to put uh, sand and rocks, rocks and dirt in the fuel tank. Thank <laughs> you. 
Russian Russian Federation. I am not a mechanic, but something tells me that putting dirt and rocks into the fuel tank probably isn't good for the uh, good good for the engine. There's also a video that surfaced allegedly showing the planting of explosive charges on a Russian Ka-52 helicopter. Uh, more than likely, this is a Russian soldier on the base who doesn't want this war to continue, and he sabotaged these helicopters, which were reported uh, damaged or destroyed on October 30th. So I'll watch. Let's watch about 20 seconds of this clip together. So you can see he's planting explosives and for some reason he wants to record himself doing it, maybe to encourage or inspire other force mobilized Russian men with access to equipment or weapons to do the same thing in order to bring this war to an end. Here's a fun story, Ukrainian HIMARS sports a spooky grin just in time for Halloween in an ode to internet culture. Ukrainian forces have painted a HIMARS launcher with a homage to one of the war's creepiest looking memes. So you can see on a HIMARS launcher, uh, maybe they got approval for this, but they decided to put a grin on the launcher, which you can see online with, with memes sometimes. But they've also painted other vehicles. This is a Ukrainian Army FMTV, and you can see they painted a uh, treasure cat on it from... Alice in Wonderland. That's pretty cool. This is not in Ukraine. This is on an army base somewhere in the United States, but HIMARS delights children uh, by launching candy at them for Halloween. <laughs> you can see it's all in good fun. The next clip I want to share with you is of Ukrainian soldiers uh, at a recently liberated city and they came across some children who were hungry and they decided to share their own food, share their own rations with them. <laughs> I've seen lots of videos similar to this of uh, Ukrainian forces liberating towns and then giving their food to the Ukrainian civilians. And what this tells me is that these Ukrainian soldiers have no fear of being resupplied. Ukraine is winning the war of logistics as their soldiers on the front lines are getting plenty of MREs, plenty of snacks, plenty of calories. Now, for the Russian forces, it appears to be the exact opposite. When we look at these recently captured Russian POWs, they're gaunt, they're thin, they're hungry, they're not getting enough food to eat on the front lines. Final clip I want to share with you is of seminary students in uh, Ternopil, and they're singing Red Ver Verburnum in the meadow. This is a Ukrainian folk song that has become symbolic of this war. Uh, let's watch about 50 seconds of this together. <laughs> Now, 
They sing very beautifully. If you want to find more of their clips, there's a TikTok channel called bro.gresco, and they have more clips of them singing. I guess one of the seminary students is the one posting these TikToks. That's all for this update video. Glory to the heroes, glory to Ukraine. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. Best way to support my channel. Comments or questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care, be safe.